Welcome, everybody, to the third annual Susan Hockey Lecture from UCL Centre for Digital Humanities. My name is Melissa Terrace. I'm the current director of UCL Centre for Digital Humanities. And we had the concept of launching this lecture series for our centre's fifth birthday two years ago. So this means that this week, UCLDH have been live for seven years. So there will be cake after, and that's why. We decided when we launched the lecture series, we decided to name it after Susan Hockey. So Susan Hockey is an emeritus professor of library and information science at UCL. When I joined UCL, she was the head of department for the School of Library Archive and Information Studies. And she is a leading figure in the establishment of humanities computing as an academic discipline back in the 1980s and the 1990s. She chaired the Association for Literary and Linguistic Computing from 1984 to 1997, and she founded the journal Literary and Linguistic Computing, which is now called the Journal of Digital Scholarship in the Humanities. She's widely published and very well respected. And so when it came to celebrate what our, our centre had accomplished over the five years, we thought, why not name the lecture after her? The first year that we had the lecture, it was actually Susan Hockey who came to talk. Um, last year, we welcomed Joanna Drucker. If you would like to see these two lectures, we do have them up on the website. And this year's lecture has been put together by a team of Dave Bevan, Lucy Stagg, and the design elements from our UCLDH designer at large, Rudolf Amann. So I'd like to thank them for organizing this event. I've been on sabbatical for four months. I just came back and it's all organized, it's great. Um, we will do the lecture, we will have questions after, and then there will be refreshments just outside. So please do join us. Just to let you know that this is being recorded, it is being live streamed. Hi, internet. Um, and if you want to talk to people online, we are using the hashtag, hashtag UCLDH. I'll also look out for some questions on the live stream as well for later. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker this evening. Niels Brugger is Professor and Head of the Centre for Internet Studies, as well as the Internet Research Infrastructure Net Lab in Aarhus University in Denmark. His research interests are web historiography, web archiving, and media theory. Within these fields, he's published monographs and a number of edited books, as well as articles and book chapters. Recent publications include History's Public Service Broadcasters on the Web, a themed issue of New Media and Society, and the web is history, using web archives to understand the past and present. That last one was published by UCL Press, so we're very happy to have you here at UCL after publishing your text from UCL Press. Uh, UCL Press, everything is open access and freely available online, so if you want to read that UCL Press book, written by Niels and his uh, co-authors and co-editors, you can do so for free. Go and have a look. He is also co-founder and managing editor of the newly founded international journal, Internet Histories, Digital Technology, Culture and Society. Without further ado, I introduce Niels with his lecture, Where Does the Born and Reborn Digital Material Take the Digital Humanities? Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored proud of being invited to give this Susan Hockney lecture. You're right, Melissa, I come from Denmark. I'm, however, a strange Dane, because I haven't seen the killing. I haven't seen the bridge, and I haven't seen Borgen. So uh, please don't, any, don't ask any questions about Icelandic sweaters or stuff like that. But I'd be happy to take other questions after the lecture. And um, this is the title of, of my lecture, and I'm going to start it with two, uh, say, two tales. One with some figures, and one with some images. So here comes the figures first, and I have to read them aloud, uh, because during the actually quite short uh, presentation that Melissa gave just a minute ago, Google processed more than one petabyte of data thousands of time of the quantity of all printed material in the Library of Congress. Almost one million photos were uploaded to Facebook, and over 300 hours of video was uploaded to YouTube. These are old figures. They're from 2012. Can, of course, be questioned, and they should be. But still, the digital material around us 
continue to grow and grow and grow, and it grows rapidly. So this was the first thing. The next one is with some images. This is the website whitehouse.gov from 20th of January this year, or 19th, sorry, as it was seen in the Internet Archive. Obama was giving over office to uh, Donald Trump. If you scroll down, you can find an item called climate change on the website. Then, as you probably know, or you know, Donald Trump took over. America had to be great again. And this is the website as it looked the day after. And if you scroll down on this website, a lot of good items, but nothing about climate change. So it raised a lot of discussion on social media, mainstream media, etc., that this uh, climate change had been removed and taken down when Trump took over. In a way, this is business as usual, because this happens every time that a new president takes office. This is George Bush's website in 2009. It has something about energy and environment, which is in a way surprising. But it is. Uh, and then Obama's from the same day. He also has something about en energy and environment. You can see it here. But he doesn't have Afghanistan, for instance. And there's a lot of the other issues that were on Bush's website that is not on Obama's website. So this happens all the time, every time a new president takes office. Actually, going back to Bill Clinton in 1996, on whitehouse.gov, they created a beautiful search engine to search all the speeches of Bill Clinton. The Republicans started to use that and to find all the faults and all the different th difficult things in Bill Clinton's speeches. So he took it down. Someone uh, found out and then he put it on again. So this is just to show you and to tell you a little bit about that the web changes uh, all the time and of course, presidents also change the website. So some of the lessons we can learn from these two tales I've started with. The first one is that the born digital material grows. It grows rapidly and it grows a lot. What I call the reborn digital material, and for now we can just say the archive material, it also grows because all the websites that I have found here in the Internet Archive are also digital material, so they continue to. The, that type of digital material also grows. We can also learn that the web is an inherent part of society, politics. We can't make do without the web today. Try to take it off out of your life just for one day and you'll find out what it, what it means actually. And we can also learn that the online web is not an archive. It's volatile, it disappears, it changes, it's removed, it, a lot of stuff happens with the online web. So we can consider it an archive, although we may have the sense that it is an archive because it's out there all the time, which it isn't. And the online web can, it has to be archived, it has to be archived in, in an active way to be preserved. It doesn't preserve itself, so to say. So the questions that these, this kind of setting has led me to are the following. First, I have this it's my impression, at least, that the digital humanities, until the end of the 90s, more or less was about digitizing stuff and using digital methods. The digital methods didn't make any sense if you didn't have the material in digital form, so digitizing was, in a way, the starting point. Then, from the late 90s, the digitized material is still there, and we still continue to digitize, but then we have in combination with that, the born digital and what I call the reborn digital material and the digital methods as well. So this, in my view, constitutes a new media environment, a new digital media environment that the digital humanities has to make do with or kind of find its way through. So these two questions, how does this new source environment affect the digital humanities? And will the digital humanities become internet and new media studies? Actually, when I was invited to give this lecture, I guess the word provocative was mentioned in, in the email I received. And this, is, this is as good as it, as it gets in terms of provocation. Uh, I also found out when I prepared this presentation that maybe I 
I'm not even going to answer these questions <laughs> because they're actually quite big questions. But I hope that what I can give is a new framing of asking these questions. So hopefully we can start a discussion maybe when I'm finished with these questions. So what I'm going to talk about, first I'm going to talk about something that I call digitality. It's not that complicated. Uh, and then I will introduce three types of digital material, then the digitality of the online web, a few words about how to archive the web, how is that actually done, and then digitality of the archived web, what, is, what, what, are, the, what are the characteristics of the archived web, and what does that imply for the researcher use of this new source, of, source type. So this is the agenda. Now you know when you can take a nap or update your Facebook profile or whatever. Um, digitality. I think it is, it is worth reflecting a little bit about the word digital in the digital humanities. So I think that's where we should start in a way. So I may not be giving a definition of the, di of the digital, but at least I, I'd like to present a framework for discussing or for, for framing what, how we could understand the digital. So that's what I'm going to talk about in this first section. As you all know, modern computers use an alphabet with two letters, zero and one. As you remarked, I didn't call them numbers because in my view, they're not numbers, they're letters. So you can actually write with zeros and ones. You don't calculate with them. You can calculate as well, but you use them to write with. And they avoid a meaning. If they had any meaning, they were not, could not be letters. I mean, our letters don't have meaning, but our numbers have meaning. So I consider zero and one as numbers, which means that we can actually write with power because it's a match. It's a, it's a question of whether there is power or not power. So this would be my, it's not my definition of digital, but it's something that we have to remind ourselves about. So all the media artifacts that we call digital, they have this digital alphabet as part of, of their being, if you could say that. But this does not mean that they are identical just because they are digital. Basically, my the argument I would like to make is that we should treat digital media differently because they treat the digital differently. So digital media are not identical just because they are, di they are digital. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on that. Because they're always entangled in, in an artifact and in text in a semiotic system. Artifacts, I'm going to say a little bit more about both. Uh, so when I say digitality, I mean the specific way of being digital, the specific ways in which the digital O and zeros are materialized in an artifact and as text. So this would be my definition of digitality and every, sort, every digital media has its own specific digitality. And digitality, um, in my view, has a double doubleness to it. I can, this is kind of the framework that I use to understand it. Because on the one side, we have one doubleness linked to the medium. Take, for instance, this, I'm not going to lift it, but take this laptop or your laptop. It's an artifact, but it's still digital as well. So it is a little bit like you have these computers here, they all share the zero and ones in different combinations, but they also are plastic, metal, glass. They, have a, they occupy a certain space. They're heavy or they're not heavy. So if you ask me what is a digital medium, I would say it is the zero and ones and their combination with an artifact. So these four computers here, they have each their digitality because they're different artifacts. And I would say the, the doubleness is the media materiality and the digital alphabet combined, and uh, I call that the digital mediacy. I use the word mediacy, and then I, I don't have any more strange words after this once, I guess. Uh, mediacy, by that I mean the specific medianess of a medium. Every type of medium comes with a certain way of being a medium. Newspapers are made of paper. You can transport them. You can transport each copy. Radio is... Uh, airwaves, you cannot transport airwaves in the same way you can newspapers, etc., etc. I use, I'm inspired here by 
uh, kind of the tradition from Martin McLuhan and onwards, uh, especially a guy called Joshua Meyerowitz. Some of you may know him. Uh, he uh, says that each medium has what he calls uh, a relatively set of fixed features. Relatively fixed features. And this is in a way the same here. This was what the first doubleness of the digitality. Then the, the next one is about the digital text, because text is digital, or if we have digital text, how could we define that? I would say we should define it at at least two levels. On the one hand, what we see on a screen, and when I say text, I have to underline that, I, I mean text in a very broad sense, any kind of semiotic system. Written text, images, moving images, and sound. So when I look at my computer here, you look at the screen, we would say this is, this is digital text. It's on a digital device. That's the first way of being digital, what we see on the screen. But it's based on something that's hidden under the hood, so to say, which is also digital. Take, for instance, a website like this. should be no surprise that below this website, there is a hidden text, which is the HTML. The HTML, this is kind of the visible layer of the digital text. This is also digital text. And if we continue, you could say, you can continue down from the HTML and down through the system until we reach all the zeros and ones. And all the layers we have up here are digital text, different layers of digital text. So if I were to, to define what is a digital text, it would be all these, it would be the visible text, or the hearable if it's sound, and all the layers of digital text below it, and how they interact. So that would be the digital textuality, in my view. So if I was asked how, could, how would I define a digital medium, I would say it's a combination of, on the one hand, an artifact that uses a digital alphabet, and a, a number of digital layers of text that are combined to form a specific, what I would call, digitality. So the digitality of a medium is a combination of it being an artifact. How it is that? It's a combination with the digital alphabet and how the layers of text are. So that would be a kind of a grid for analyzing or identifying the digital. What I'm going to talk about then for the rest of, of this lecture is only the digital textuality. I don't have the time to go into talking about modems and uh, mainframe computers, and which would be on the artifact side of things. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus on the digital textuality for the rest of the lecture, just so you know. So I use this, this approach, this talking about digitality, to try to figure out, are there any ways of clustering all the digital material that we have? Again, based on the assumption that all digital material are not digital in the same way, which means that they have to be treated differently when we are going to uh, preserve them, collect them, and use them in studies. We cannot necessarily use the same tools and methods on all digital media because they're digital media in different ways. So the, I, I have these uh, three types of digital material. That it's, it's my way of clustering uh, the, material, the digital materials. And it's based on, on provenance. By that I mean, how did, this, how did the digital material become digital? Where did, it, where did it come from? How did it end up being digital? So I use provenance as a way of kind of a criterion for the ways I cluster digital material. It's going to be a little bit more clear now. The first group of digitized material or digital material is digitized material. And digitized material, that's material that has existed in a non-digital form and then has been transformed into digital, material, digital form. It shouldn't be any surprise. Here illustrated with the, with the Bible, Gutenberg Bible. We have a non-digital original to go back to. The next clustering of digital material is what I call the born digital. It has never existed in any other form than digital form. Here illustrated with a website. So there is no original to go back to. What you see is what you get, basically. And then the last type of digital material is what I call the reborn digital. And that's material that has never existed in any other form than digital, and that has been collected and preserved, and that has been changed in that process. 
in less than an hour you know what I mean here. <laughs> because that's exactly what happens with the web, the online web, when we're going to archive it, we actually change it in a very fundamental way. So that's what I mean with reborn, born, born digital material that has been changed in the archiving process or the preservation. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what characterizes the born digital first, and I'll do that by comparing to digitized collections. So I'm about to continue to the next point about what characterizes the online web compared to digitized collections. Then after that, I will have a look at how does the born digital become reborn? Basically, what is web archiving? So that's going to be the next section after that. And then the third section is about the reborn digital material, what characterizes it? And what, how does that affect the research that you can do with it? And that's going to be done again in a comparison with a digitized collection. So this is how this, this uh, kind of model is going to be used in, in the rest of the lecture. So the digitality of the online web. What characterizes the online web? We use it probably all of us on a daily basis, but, but what, what characterizes this actually? What, what can we say are the relatively fixed features of the online web? And I'm, as I mentioned, I'm going to compare it to a digitized collection. In my mind, I imagine uh, scanned newspapers, could be any type of digitized collection, but newspapers that are scanned, it's a very good example in many ways. But you can probably come up with more examples. And I'm comparing that to the online web. A digitized collection of, say, newspapers, it's a text and it only has one layer. What you see on a scanned newspaper is what you get. There's only that only layer. You can add an OCR layer, but that's added. It's not part of it when it, when it was kind of digitized in the beginning. It's very different with the online web because it's two layered from the beginning. The web comes with two layers. It comes with what you see in your browser and it comes with the HTML file which is showing or which is beneath what you see. Your HTML file, the HTML file is retrieved from a web server, then it's interpreted in your browser, and then you see pictures and text. But the web has these two layers. So what you see in your browser is actually a two-layer text. But what you see in a scanned newspaper is only one layer. You may have the OCR, but it's added afterwards. The two layers of the web are there from the beginning. The second point with a digitized collection is that you you have this non-digital non -digital original to go back to, meaning that if you have a newspaper, you scan it, you have one file for each, p each page. Maybe you have one file for the entire copy of the newspaper. If you go to the web, it doesn't work like that. When you see a web page in your web browser, it's not one file. It's, it's a lot of files. It's an HTML file, basically, and then it goes and grabs bits and pieces from a web server, from other web servers. So what you see in your web browser is a fragmented thing. It's HTML and other files. So it's fragments compared to a digitized collection, which is one page per copy, so to say. And the last thing is hyperlinks. They can be added on a digitized collection if you want to jump from one page in a newspaper to another. You can do add the hyperlinks, so you can jump. But with the web, the hyperlink is there from the beginning. If you don't have the hyperlinks, in a way, you don't have the web. You could imagine a number of web pages on the web that didn't have any hyperlinks. Uh, but it wouldn't work. I mean, So the hyperlink is an inherent part of the web. But it's not an inherent part of a digitized collection. And these three features of the web, of the online web, it's two layers, fragments, and its hyperlinks have a huge impact on how you can approach it uh, when you want to study it and how you can archive it if you want to do that because it causes a number of problems as we'll see uh, in a few minutes. So these three things with the online web opens up a number of possibilities and they give, surely they give a lot of challenges as well. So, 
archiving the web, I'm going to compare how the born digital became the reborn. How does the archiving of the web actually take place? I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with that. I know a couple of you are. but uh, So now you get a crash course in, in, in web archiving. But why should we bother? Why should we preserve the web? I showed you the Obama-Trump uh, thing and should be, in a way, reason enough. But it changes all the time. The average lifetime, there's a lot of debate about how, how you can calculate that, but roughly speaking, uh, is between two and four months. And the other figure is actually quite, uh, quite thought-provoking. As you can see, a lot of what was on in the, in, in the web archive has actually disappeared on the online web. So the, the web is, is volatile. It disappears all the time. So that in itself is reason enough to keep it, if you want to keep it in terms of cultural heritage, or if you just want to keep it to study it. Because we usually document what we study. And if you want to do that, if you study the online web, you have to preserve it. So web archiving is in kind of a part of studying the online web as well. So I use this very broad definition of web archiving, any form of deliberate and purposive collecting and preserving of web material. It's much broader than people at the cultural heritage institutions understand web archiving. But I use this one because if you come as a historian and you want to study the, the past by using the, the archive web, you may find it in different forms than the ones that you can find at the cultural heritage institutions. So these are some of the ways that you can archive the web. The most widespread one is web crawling, and it's based on following hyperlinks. It works like this. You take a number of web domains, URLs, put them in a list, put them in the software, press go, and this is the, the short version, <laughs> and then you press go, and uh, then the software runs out, it contacts the first web server, say, okay, give me this web page, gets the web page back, and, and that's it. Then it can take that web page and rip all the links from that and do the same once again with those links. Go out and grab that, take that back, take out the links from those web pages and continue as long as you like it to in a way, until you archive the entire web basically. Uh, so this is how web crawling works. As you can see, if we don't have hyperlinks, web crawling doesn't work well. But it's also a problem in many ways, as we can see. The most easy way of, web, of archiving the web is simply, and you've probably done that, all of you, to take a screenshot. It works well, it's quick and dirty, and it's quite a good way of doing it. A more extended uh, way of doing it is making a so-called screen movie, where you film what's happening on the screen, be used for stuff that you cannot archive with crawling, for instance, uh, streamed audio and video and stuff like that. You can also use APIs to simply retrieve the content from the producer. If you want to archive Facebook, Twitter, or whatever, like they have open APIs, so you can use that. You can also uh, have old offline web from the owner of the web. In, uh, in the journal that Melissa mentioned that I am uh, publishing or I am editing, Internet Histories, we have an article in the inaugural issue about some, some people in, in Holland who found some old material of a website about Amsterdam and they reconstructed that. So you can actually, it's also another, it's a way of preserving the web simply just as someone has kept it. And then you can actually find the old web in non-digital media. If you want to know something about what the web looked like in, say, 94 or 95, you should use these small how-to books, how to create your own website. It's a gold mine of, how the, of what the web looked like. And it's the only source we have for that, for that period. But I'm going to talk about, and this one is misplaced, it should be uh, just above, it should be about web crawling, because I'm focusing now on web crawling. The other types of archiving the web, I'm not going to talk about that, because web crawling is the most wide, widely used and the, by far the most complicated. So, as I mentioned earlier, 
many of the problems and the challenges we have with archiving the web are emerging out of its being fragmented and hyperlinked, as you will see. Again, I'm comparing to the digitized collection. Digitized collection compared to what, hap what happens in, when you digitize, and again, using newspapers to be scanned, and what happens when you archive the web. So you have two columns again. <coughs> Digitization is, as I mentioned, based on a non-digital origin. We have a, an original to go back to, which is always nice. I mean, if it doesn't work, you can go back and check, okay, the newspaper did, didn't look like this, so we can do it again. You don't have that on the web, or you may have it, probably you don't have it, because it may have changed, and it may have changed rapidly. So imagine we have to do the archiving without any, in, in, in many ways, in, without any way of, of going back and checking, especially if you do harvest or web archiving of large amounts of, of web data. It's, it's simply not a question to, to check it. Of course, we always, always have to decide what we want to preserve and how we want to preserve it. We have to do that with the digitized world as well. But it's not very complex. It's, by and large, transparent. And it's very systematic. So if you want to scan books, newspapers, you do it. You can check it. You find errors. The OCR didn't work well. You can go back and change it. And it's systematic. If you, change, if you find one error, you can find that error all the place, all the places, so to, so to say. This is not the case with the web. Um, it is much more complex. It is, in many ways, not transparent at all. And it is really unsystematic. I took this small uh, page here. It's from uh, some, um, you could say, amateur software, something that I can use, <laughs> called HTTrack which is made to archive web. And you just have, just, this is just to illustrate how many settings you have to make. For instance, links, you have to decide if it should go to other web domains when it fo follows links. Imagine you're going to archive one website, say uh, BBC's website, and you want to do that. Is it then okay that it goes to other web servers if there's a link pointing to that? You would say basically no, but maybe it's a good idea because maybe some of the graphics that they use are put on another web server. So in some cases, you have to go to other web servers, although you don't want to. So that's just one thing you have to make settings about. You also have to make settings about the MIME types. Do I want specific file types included or excluded? And you have to uh, set all these settings. And there, this is just a very small one. The professional ones, you have lots of other settings. So this means it's, it's a much more complex. And you, it basically, once you set the crawl out, the, out there on the web, you don't know what happens. They send something back, but in a way, you don't know exactly what happens. So it's not transparent, and it's not systematic. So what is digitized, when you digitize, is, is what you see. I mean, the newspaper, you scan it, and that's what you get. This is not the case with the web. What is archived there is not what you see, but is actually what you don't see, namely the HTML files. It's the code that is archived, which we have to have in our minds, so to say. So once you, when you go to the web, you look at a web page, this is what you see. But this is not what a web crawler sees. A web crawler sees this. It sees HTML files and links to, to images, to graphics, and to news feeds, to whatever. So to a web crawler, archiving is archiving all these bits and pieces. Digitizing is, as you probably also can hear, it's much more robust. It can be remade. You can do it again because you have an original to, to, do, to do it again with, so to say. Web archiving, things go wrong. New technologies may have been invented since you did your web crawling at the last time. So once the web crawler encounters that, it just stops or doesn't do anything or just continues, so you don't get all of it. A lot of stuff simply <laughs> cannot be archived, so this is in itself a challenge. Uh, something called crawler traps may also be encountered. A crawler trap is when a crawler 
tries to archive something that is, in a way, unendless. For instance, if it encounters a calendar. Calendars tend to be unendless. So it will just continue and continue and continue until it reaches the time limit, time limit that you have set. And then it stops, and then you may not get the rest of that website, although you would like to, because it just stopped. So web archiving, it goes well in many cases, but it also goes wrong in many cases. Digitization, you have this stable original. Uh, with, uh, with the archiving of the web, you have what I call the dynamics of updating, which is a strange, strange thing. Imagine again you want to archive BBC's website. It's a huge website. So you start, let's say it takes two hours, but in these two hours, the website may have changed a number of times. So once you're finished, what you started archiving has changed. And you always start, usually, from the top with the front page. And then you continue following the links down, down through the structure. And when you reach the bottom, all the layers above that may have changed while you were archiving downwards. So this is a little bit, if you imagine, a radio or television program that you are pressing the bottom, bottom say, record. And once you are halfway through, the beginning has changed, and it continues like that. It's a mess. But that's uh, one of the fundamental things that characterizes web archiving, that you don't know if you get it all, and you don't know what you get in many ways. And you have this dynamic of updating. The updating takes place, and it changes what you archive in a way while you archive it. The last point about web archiving. Uh, a digitized collection, you have what I call temporal and spatial subdivisions are usually made before the digitizing and by the producer. What do I mean by that? I simply mean, if we take newspaper again as an example, newspapers come as copies. So when you digitize something, you have a copy, it's bound, your pages, you don't get just a pile of pages and say, okay, you go and, you go and digitize that. You get copies nicely with pagination and page numbers, all that stuff. So it is cut in terms of space to form a copy. And in terms of time, newspapers also come with temporal, in temporal slices once a day. So you have a copy, nice copy, and one from each day. And it's made by the producer, not by the one who's digitizing. You wouldn't say, OK, I don't like this newspaper being 10 pages. I only digitize the first five, and then the other five for the next day. That doesn't work like that. So we usually, when we digitize, follow the ways that the producer has sliced up things for us. But this is not the same with the web, because all the temporal and spatial subdivisions are made not by the producer, but by the archiving institution or archiving actor. Because take a website. A website is not a newspaper. It's not a radio program. It doesn't come with a clear start or an end. It's a continuum. And it just continues like that. So who should make the time slices? One institution may say, I would like to archive it every day. Another may say, I would like to archive it every second day or every fifth day. So they get different time slices. Some would say, I would like to continue my archiving throughout two or three days. So those time slices of, 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 of this object are made by the one who is archiving. And the same goes for the spatial delimitation, because as I mentioned before with the BBC's website, where should it stop? Do I want it to stop? You would, the immediate impression would be we'd, we could use the web domain name, BBC, uh, is it CO, .co? Okay, uh, we could use that and say, you should just stay within the boundaries of that web domain. But then we may not get it on, because many of the graphics may be put on other web, web servers and images in another one. We may get a feed from Facebook, which we don't get if we delimit it uh, clearly to the domain name. So in a web archive or in a, a digitized collection, we only get one copy of each. There's no good reason for us to make 10 copies of the same newspaper page. It doesn't make sense. So we only get one of each, which is, which is fine. 
Um, but we may get material archived more than once in a web archive. How does that come? Imagine you have, say, 1,000 web domains you want to archive. You start with the first one, so you start with that, and then it continues for a week. Once you get to number 800 something after a week, that web domain may have a link to the one you started with. So you get that once again. And that continues like that. So you get, may get the same web entity several times, which is strange, and it's not necessarily exactly the same, because time, time has elapsed, so it may have changed a little bit. You don't know if it has or if it hasn't. So, this was a little bit about web archiving. And now the last point I have, the last section. What then characterizes the result of this, of this process? Again, now I'm going to compare the reborn digital material to a digitized collection. So what characterizes what we get in a web archive and what are the implications for the researcher who's going, who's going to use it afterwards? As I have put on the slide, the most general characteristic is an, a constitutive uncertainty. In, in any respect, you, you are uncertain about what is in our archive. How did it get there? Why did it get there? What did it get in there? Of course, you can have a, some sense of it, but it's, it's not straightforward to find out exactly what you have in a web. Of course, it, there's, a, there's a, uh, a question of scale. If it's a very small one, of course, it's easier. If it's a large national web archive, it's, it's difficult. And if it's the Internet car archive, it's, it's even more difficult. So this is just to remind what I, what I mentioned earlier. What is archived is HTML files, other files. It's the invisible stuff. It's the fragments and the fragments patched together by the use of the HTML and the, and the hyperlinks. So this is just to remind you about what went into the archive. So what, what we have in an archive, in a web archive, is basically a bucket of interconnected files. We don't have what you see in your browser. We have a bucket of files. They're interconnected because they're hyperlinked. So this is just a small illustration. I'm going to use it later, so that's why I, I put it on, on this slide. Uh, we have the online web, this cloudy thing here. It's archived, and then we have just files. And it's not files that you can see as you can see a digitized newspaper, for instance, because it's HTML files. So again, now I'm comparing the digitized collection to the archived web. What characterizes these two types of digital material? What are their different digitalities? A digitized collection is basically systematic, it's ordered, and it's homogeneous. You know what you want it to digitize. You have made quality check you know more or less what you get into it. But of course, you may not know all of it, but the problems are minor if you compare them to a web archive, at least. Because what you get there is something that is to a highly degree of unsystematic. It's messy and it's heterogeneous. But this, this is what we have as researchers. So we, we, we have to learn to make do with it. Digitized collection, as I mentioned before, you have one of each, and that's good, and that's how it should be. In a web archive, in many ways, you have too little and too much. You have too little because you couldn't archive it all, because it's not possible to archive, say, an entire national web domain like that. You can do that, but the time it takes to archive it, and even, even if it's only a website, it takes some time, and you're losing something in that time period of time that it takes to archive. So you get too little in your archive. You simply don't, don't get all of it. But you also get too much. As I mentioned before, you may have several versions of the same web, web entity or web page from slightly different points in time. So you have this strange mixture, mixture of getting too little and too much. And you, in a way, don't know exactly if you have too little or too much. The digitized collection is much more spatially consistent. It has clear borders. The original we started with, if it was a newspaper, had, it had pages, comes with pages, they're bound, etc., etc. 
the web, what you have uh, in an archive web, uh, or the web, archive web is basically inconsistent in many ways because some of the web domains may have been archived. Only the front page, others may have been archived. I don't know, thousands of pages. So they don't have the same spatial uh, distribution in a way. Temporal consistent is also something that, in a way, it, it's, it's even not a question that you can ask to a digitized collection because, of course, it's temporal consistent. I mean, when you put a newspaper page on a scanner and you press scan, it scans and you get what you have on your, on your scanner, so to say. But I'm going to illustrate that this is not the case with what you see in a web archive. Because you have these inconsistencies in terms of time and space in a web archive uh, because of the dynamics of updating and the problem I mentioned before that it takes time to archive. Just to illustrate what that means if you want to study this material. Again, you start your archiving of say 1,000 web domains at one point and you have links on, 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 on the website, it points to something else. You have a link source that points to a link target. But the link target may not have been archived at the same time. It may have been archived a week later, if it is archived at all. And that link may point to another link source or link target that may have been archived a week later again. So if you want to make a study of a link graph or hyperlink network based on web archive material, you may get something, you may get a link network that is temporally inconsistent because things were not archived at the same time. And that may stretch over months. So you have this, it, it has this temporal inconsistency to it. The did size collection, you get copies. Of course, it's not exactly the same. You move from paper to, to, to digital, but it's, it's by and large a copy. This is not what you get in a web archive because as you actually, in a way, hopefully can see, what you get is actually versions. It's versions, it's different versions of what was once online. Remember the settings I talked about earlier. You had to set how many links it should follow, should take certain file types and not other file types. Imagine uh, three, four of us setting up our web archivings differently and we go and archive the exactly same website, we'll probably get something different. So this means that the aura that was usually uh, connected to something that was not technically reproduced is actually with this digital material because it's unique in many ways. So you have unique versions and not copies. So every, all the archiving actors may have something that is unique. And it may even be, as I mentioned here, a new creation or something that you create. Because if you imagine the website I talked about before, we start from the top, we get something. When we drill down through the website, we get different things. When we combine that in the web archive, it wasn't like that at all at any time on the online web because it doesn't fit from different times. And the unique versions, there's none of the unique versions that can be identified as the most original one. We only have a chain of versions. The temporality on the page, I mentioned that a little bit before. Temporality, when you look at an at a at a digitized newspaper page, there is no temporality in it, in, in the page. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. You have just scanned it and it has one time. But with a web page, this is very different because when you replay a web page, uh, you actually have some kind of hidden or embedded temporality. I'm going to, uh, to tell you a little bit about how that happens. Because they ha there is time embedded in replaying a web page if you use uh, the software called the Wayback Machine. Some of you may have, been, have visited uh, the Internet Archive. They use the Wayback Machine. So does uh, the British Library's Web Archive and many other web archives. So what happens? This is uh, the BL's uh, website from 2009 as I found it in the Internet Archive. It looks, it looks nice. Uh, in some way it looks nice, at least all the, all the pictures are there and, and 
things like that. So this is what you will see if you go and retrieve that website or that web page from July 2009. But what you can see is that maybe this picture, these pictures, they were not archived on 23rd of July. They may have been archived a week before, a week later. So what the Wayback Machine does as a re replaying device is that it says, OK, he wants to look at 23rd July, but I don't have all the stuff. So I go grab what I have from a week before, a week later, years later, and patches that together on the web page, which is what we see. So in fact, you have to go down in the, in the source code to check the timestamp of each of the bits and pieces. So in that sense, we have a sort of temporality embedded in the presentation of a web page, which we do not have in a digitized collection at all. And this is, and thanks to Jane, who's sitting up there, for giving me uh, this, uh, this uh, screenshot. It's, it's a software called Memento. They have something on the web called the Memento Time Travel. And it works like this. If you are a web archive that, uh, that uses this Memento protocol, then you can add it to your, to your holdings in your web archive. And then you can go to this web page, timetravelmementoweb.org, put in a web address, and then say, press the reconstruct button up here, and then it reconstructs the page, and then it adds up here that this is the time you want it, but some of the pieces are from seven minutes before, and these are the day before, and this is a month before. And it comes from these different archives. So it goes out and gets the bits and pieces from different archives that are part of the memento. And this is just exactly the same that happens if it doesn't go to different archives, but just stays within the same archive, but it still goes out and gets bits and pieces. So, um, yeah, a few last points uh, about this point. Digitized collection, what characterizes that is a relatively stable collection. What is digitized by and large doesn't change. There's a, an issue about long-term preservation, of course. That also is the case for web archives. But web archives uh, must follow the development of the web, and that's, that's changing rapidly. So to be able to, to not just to, to collect them, and, and to collect it, but also to preserve it and to make it available, has, is, is kind of a function of the changings, changes of the web. Because you're not managing the web. It just continues and develops as it, as it will, so to say. With a digitized collection, you, you, you have these stable originals to go back to and de decide how you want to do it. Uh, and the web archive, they, they, the web archive, they change as well. They change their policies, they change their, their crawling software, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they have a history of their own, and, and that history is, is also very short, actually, and changes all the time. Last point about uh, what characterizes the archived web, or that uh, the digitized collection, they are easily, they're easily documented, because you have information about the provenance. It's not something that, uh, it's something that you have already, so to say, before you start digitizing. But with the archived web, it's extremely difficult to document. It's difficult to document uh, how you made the archiving, what went wrong, etc. So some of the information are there in the web archive in the so-called crawl log. It's a log file that's made during the crawling. But it's not straightforward. At least I don't know how to, to, to use that. But some of the information are there, but it's not, it's not made available in a, in a useful way for researchers. So this, uh, I'm going to, to present here, what, what does this mean for researchers, that the web archive has these characteristics? Well, it means that we have this here, huge bucket of HTML files and files of any type. I just uh, learned the other day from uh, some of the people I know at the Danish National Web Archive, there are about 1,500 different file types. 
Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's a challenge so what you have here in that bucket. The majority of it is HTML files and PDF and PowerPoints and Word, etc. But there, is, there are a lot of files actually. So what, what the researchers, uh, and, and that's one of the interesting things and one of the, the, the different things with the web archive compared to a digitized collection is that you have it already as fragments and HTML files, the two layers, and you have the hyperlinks. So you can actually grab grab stuff in the bucket of files in different ways, depending on what you want to study, which is extremely interesting uh, because you don't have that with other collections. So if you, for instance, are interested in what, what did the website look like in, in, in the past, you could say to the, the web archive, couldn't you please uh, make it look like something that I had in a web browser 15 years ago? So this is what they can do. They can go down, pick up the bits and pieces, and do what I mentioned before with the Wayback Machine, although we, don't, we have this temporality in the web page, but still, we can see something similar to what it looked like way back. But there may be another researcher. He comes, I don't care about what it looked like. I'm going to make a network analysis, so just give me all the links. So he would grab all the links out of the bucket and say, I just, I just need links. I just want to make a link graph. I don't care about all the other stuff. Other researchers may come and say, give me the named entities. That's what I want to study. You may want to study words in a big sense. You can make word clouds, whatever, any type of analysis of, of text, written text. Or you could say, I'm only interested in the pictures. I don't care about links or how it looked, just pictures. I want to make image recognition, how many landscape photographs were on the Danish web, how many portraits, etc., etc. I don't care about the rest. And you could just continue with all the ideas that you may have as a researcher. So this is a very malleable <laughs> thing. You, could, you can do with it what you want in many ways because it's not formed. It's these bits and pieces and fragments. So you have these possibilities actually linked to, to working with Archive Web that you have the HTML code and the file name extensions, which is partly a way of pre-coding. It's kind of coded for you. It's, HTML is, after all, a markup language. So it is marked up in some sense, but only in some sense because it's unsystematic. Uh, it is systematic to some degree, but people don't use HTML properly all the time. So you may have something marked up correctly and others that you don't have. So it has this messiness uh, to it again. And another possibility is the one I mentioned before with the, with, the, with the drawing. You have many ways of approaching the collection. You have all these layers and all these approaches, whatever you want to grab out of the HTML, you can take all, all the way, all the things that you can make a tag around, you can take that out. The challenge is, of course, is to unlock this messy and inconsistent black box. Uh, I've been working with web archives for a number of years, and uh, it's, it's still mind-boggling what, what, how to do that in any reasonable way. But luckily, the book that uh, was mentioned in the introduction, there's some very good studies in that. People have actually done some beautiful studies based on archive work. And, uh, one of the challenges is as well that the many ways of approaching the collection in a web archive is also something that opens up new ways of uh, collaboration between the research environment and the collection holders. In many cases, national libraries, national archives. So we have to have some new organizational structures to negotiate how we want all the bits and pieces taken out of the bucket because they can do it in all the ways that each of us want to. So they have to come up with some minimum standards. You can get this, this, and this, and this. Uh, but it's, it's open for negotiation. And believe me, the web archives, the national web archives, don't know exactly what the researchers want. So they may, may make something that we may not want. <laughs> so uh, if you're interested in, in, in studying the archive web, you should really uh, 
get in contact with those uh, with the collection owners. So, second last slide. Um, I, I would say with all these challenges of the archive web, what we need is what I call a philology of the archive web. Because many of these questions that I've talked about are kind of similar to the ones that philology has already, always dealt with. Versions, copies, comparing, all that stuff. So I would advocate for uh, some sort of philology of the archive web. So we, we should be able to compare all these versions, fragments, two layers, etc. And again, we have something that can help us with the archive web because we actually have the HTML code, which can tell us a lot. So we can actually use what, is, in a way, is a challenge. We can use that as an advantage because it tells us a lot. So we, can, we just have to have the right tools to unlock the information that is embedded in the HTML files to tell us a lot about how they went into the archive and what's in them. So we need what I call a new philological toolbox so that we can make as informed choices as possible. As it is now in many, most national web archives, it is a black box more or less. So back to my questions. Uh, and I, I, I still think, don't think that I'm, I'm able to answer the question. <laughs> But I hope that I have been able to frame the question in, 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 a, in a way that makes sense to you. Especially the last one. Will the digital humanities become internet and new media studies? Well, at least the born digital and the reborn digital material continues to grow. And I could see some good collaborations between uh, the research environment working with internet and web archives and the digital humanities communities working more or less with digitized collections. There may be some good and interesting ways of collaborating. I think I'll stop with that. Thank you. So I just wanted thinking about that in the context of web archives, like web archives, where are we with, um, uh, let's say, cultural criticism of the ideology or the, you know, the, the assumptions mm -hmm. embedded in the, the type of web archive mm -hmm. strategy? Yeah, the policies of a web archiving, basically. Or the Say again. So if I could summarize the question. Okay, uh, I'll give it a try. Uh, that uh, in traditional archives that have been uh, made available, um, there were some assumptions in, involved in that about uh, kind of the politics of how the archive was made, basically. And then you asked if something similar were taking place in terms of web or in, in, in relation to web archives, or if if there were any discussion about that. Yeah, and yeah. in terms of Software yeah. and the the um, uh, the assumptions that are embedded in the software and the approaches mm, mm, um, yeah. in the context of web archiving. Yeah. There have been uh, some studies about that. For instance, some uh, of my colleagues in Holland uh, in the Digital Methods Initiative in Amsterdam have made some studies about what does it mean that uh, the archive web is usually presented in the Wayback Machine, as you saw it before. Which types of studies does that 
uh, kind of enable and which type of study does it not enable. Uh, and in terms of the collection and the, the collection policies as such, um, depends on which, which, which web archive you actually are, uh, are dealing with in a way. You have, you could say basically you have a continuum. On the one end you have a continuum, of that continuum you have web archives focused on, you could say special collections or selective collections. They want to archive uh, the best and most beautiful websites of a country or whatever, or uh, websites in relation to a specific event or something like that. And on the other end of the continuum, you have uh, the more broad web archives that, in a way, doesn't have, uh, doesn't focus on anything particular, but just archive an entire national domain like .uk or .dk in Denmark. And in that in that case. Uh, anything that is on the on the national domain will be included. So there's it, it's it's a very large, broad policy you could say, uh, and and that's mm, basically the majority of the national web archives use that policy. Some of them use both, so that you can have an an archiving of the entire national domain, and then next to that selective archivings of different events or uh, themes or whatever. Hello, my name is Lukas Schulz from uh, LSE. So I was looking at this, your history of digital humanities and then I was kind of expecting 2000s, 2010s. So I, was, I would like to ask you about these more recent developments and I'm thinking specifically about the rise of social media and and platforms and how they kind of turn into being the platforms about gathering and processing data. In a way, it's a form of uh, archiving our, our interactions on, on the internet and we have access to them only through, the, through their APIs. So that's why I was thinking, mm. what are your thinking about those kind of datification in terms of web archiving? The social media have, have had, a, it has a, they have a history of their own in a way because they started on the web, most of them. So when they were on the web, they were archived in web archives, by and large. But then they moved to other platforms also. So they had, you have both. You have Facebook on the web, you have Facebook on mobile media. Uh, and it's, you can archive, as f from a web archiving point of view, you can archive Facebook, and it's done in, I guess, most national web archives. S but but it's, it's, it's a matter of selecting, because how can you uh, find what you want to archive on Facebook if you are a web archive? It's, it's quite difficult, actually. Of course, all that's behind uh, closed uh, gates, uh, you can't archive that. You, you can't archive that anyway. It's, it's, it's private, but the public uh, sections of, of Facebook can be archived, and, and, and it is archived in, by many archives. But then, uh, for the, from the API side, some of the national web archives, in particular in France, in France they have two national web archives, one at the BNF, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and one at INA. Uh, and the INA, uh, National Web Archive in France, they actually archive uh, using the APIs. So they have made a very, very impressive Twitter archive in relation to the shootings uh, in Paris uh, two years ago, based on the API. And they combine that with traditional web archiving as well. So it is, it is done uh, by some web archives, but it's not trivial at all because for whatever reason, web, uh, Facebook does not want to be archived, uh, even, even though it's, it's public web page. Hi, um, thanks for the interesting talk. So this is actually a follow-up question. Um, so especially with social media, a lot of people post things about their daily lives and they might delete it afterwards. So I was wondering about any ethical concerns regarding archiving social media or data that people um, delete. Um, they might not want it to be, um, to be archived and then it ends up in these um, archives. Yeah. 
It's, it's a huge question, and within the research community as well as when, within web archiving communities, the ethical discussions have, haven't been, been taken in many ways. My own uh, take on that would be a distinction between public and private that we have from other types of media. So if you make something publicly available, then it's public and then it should be archived by the institutions that have that as their remit. And, and that's it. Then there's another question about how we should make it, make it uh, accessible. Because uh, one thing is collecting and one thing is making it accessible. So you, in my view, we should collect whatever is publicly available and then we can, can consider how we want to make it accessible. Because it's another, it's another distinction. And even though we want to make it accessible, maybe only for researcher use, then the researchers have to have their ethical considerations about how they should use it. But I would say we, if it's publicly available, it's publicly available. And, and how can we decide if it's publicly available? In my view, it's, it's quite easy because public means made available to a public. So if everyone can get access, it is public. If everyone cannot get access, it's not public. And, 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 that's, and that's how it is. Of course, there's a lot of people who don't realize that, and they say stupid things, and they like to delete them. Uh, but they did that in earlier as well. I mean, you can go and find uh, radio programs that have been aired. People have said stupid things, and they've tried to have it deleted, which we haven't done. Luckily, I would say. So, so we just have to educate uh, ourselves to, to use this medium. And again, it's up to the researchers who are going to use it in, in the end. I have a question that goes a little bit more on the, in the direction of the challenge of the underlying technologies. Um, one of the problems that I see with web archiving in the traditional web crawling sense is that nowadays more and more aspects of the web are programmatically generated. I mean, one example are Flash-based web pages, for instance. Mm -hmm. But as many of us also may know, Flash is currently on the way out, yeah. right? So um, at that point, even if you manage to crawl all the Flash content, you suddenly have to start emulating outdated mm -hmm. Flash browsers that probably also don't have the latest security updates, et cetera, et cetera, just in order to be able to look at the web page. And um, I think that's surely a challenge, and it somewhat uh, reminds me of the irony of um, you know, a completely different discipline, which is trying to archive software. Mm. And they have the problem that the operating systems are currently changing, and so they work with emulators and so on, but they're, um, they're now hitting, hitting the problem that many softwares are now living in the web. So they can basically replicate a piece of software, but without an, active, an actual server yeah, yeah, yeah. being maintained at the other end, they're stuck. So it seems to me as if these people who try, try to archive software and the new challenges now for web archiving as if they're basically two sides of the same coin. So my question is, is there, is there currently, any, are there any attempts of these communities to come together uh, to basically come up with a holistic way to map out cyberspace, if you <laughs> have to come up with a name for it? At least the problem is there, definitely. And, and Flash is a very good example because uh, in, you couldn't archive Flash actually with, with web crawlers in, in, for some years. I guess they can do it now, but now it's, it's actually obsolete, more or less. Uh, so, and, and I don't know how, they, if, if, if you can see it actually in, in for instance, the Wayback Machine. Uh, as far as I know, the, the only actor I can see who does something like, like that about combining software preservation and web archiving is the Internet Archive. Because they have a huge, huge software library, you could say. Um, and I guess it's more or less just up to someone to just to, to fight, to try to combine all that. But it is, it's a huge problem because you have to have the entire running environment of the server, the browser, and the internet in between, basically. And it's, emulation is used a lot, and someone, someone are trying to do that. There's a website called Old Web, uh, where they actually try to emulate things. So, so these actually do yeah, that's, it, it's, at least it's, it's a discussion about 
how it, it started actually in the beginning when Web Archive was, was young in a way. Should, should you try to take all the web that was archived throughout all the years and show it in the same machine, so to say, which then is the Wayback machine? Or should you emulate the running environment from each of the years, having all the plugins and all the browsers and seeing it in the browsers originally? And maybe even seeing it in the same speed. There is a reason why the World Wide Web was called the World Wide Wait in the beginning, because uh, it was slow. And, and that's also why there were no images, because images took time and it was slow. So it, it's a huge question. Uh, I don't think anyone has actually dealt with it substantially. Uh, quite early on in your talk, uh, you mentioned cultural heritage institutions. Mm -hmm. And I just thought you should know that there are some of us among you. And uh, that, in fact, uh, for many of us, uh, digitized collections uh, do not have only one layer. They also have the layer of metadata, for example, mm. that is created, or, uh, or even digital object identifiers, or the data that underpins the pixel construction of an image. And that, uh, that uh, problematizing that a bit more would mm. be valuable uh, to, to us, uh, those of us who know that actually there, there isn't just one copy of every newspaper, that in fact there may be numerous copies of bits of newspapers and all of them have different metadata and all of those copies have different contexts in the same way that your bucket uh, is full of 1,500 different kinds of files. This is also true for, um, for digitized collections uh, which actually don't have a temporal consistency really because the digital object itself which is, uh, which is, has its own temporality references the temporality that might be inherent in the content of the image, but these multiple temporalities are also to be problematized. So um, I think the, the, the important issue for, for the kind of work that cultural heritage uh, institutions do with digitized collections and then born digital material in relation to supporting researchers or indeed doing our own research mm -hmm. is actually the dovetailing of these two very different orders of thing. Uh, so uh, some of what you have said has very, been very helpful to me in understanding how to do this dovetailing mm. uh, so that research questions can be answered across these multiple kinds of material. Mm. But I wondered if you were thinking about that in relation to, for example, the image files that might be in your, your bucket that might also represent the digitized work uh, works that uh, many archivists and collection managers are uh, are in fact creating. So you mean if there are any digitized collections in, in the web archive, is that what you... Well, I'm assuming that there are because, for example, there, there, online, there are, be. yes, yeah. uh, and I just wondered uh, if you were thinking back towards the mm -hmm. digitized collections that, uh, that, you, uh, that you have used almost as a kind of control uh, study mm. in your in your talk, mm. are you thinking back through to them via the kind of research questions that you're asking? No, not not exactly. I didn't uh, didn't have that take on it actually. Could you elaborate a little bit on, about that about the newspapers? Because now I'm, now I'm curious. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, fifteen, fifteen, fifteen yeah, yeah, okay. megabytes. Uh, do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea that, that digitized cultural material is singular and mm. uh, of one layer, I think, is problematic for mm. your control structure that you show. But then the sort of the differences are how big are they? I mean, uh, well, they, the, the 
can between these files are, are enormous and also between their mm. metadata uh, standards. So mm -hmm. Yeah, because with the web, the web doesn't come with metadata except for the HTML file. The HTML file. <coughs> so an, a, a web archive usually doesn't have metadata, uh, which is... <laughs> Uh, what, I mean, you were asking uh, what, what archivists can do for yeah. media it's, researchers. I'm asking what media researchers yeah. can do for, for <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we, we it, I, I was part of, uh, of the first discussions in Denmark about the establishing of a national Danish web archive. It was back in 2000, 2001. And uh, there was a huge discussion if, if, if metadata should be added to what was in the web archive. And, and that discussion stopped quite rapidly <laughs> because uh, it's one million web domains, four times per year. So metadata was not something that could done down to each web domain. There were one million of them. And that's what's only the Danish web. If you go to the British or the UK web, it's 10 million web domains. So metadata is, is not an option. But what we would like as, as scholars that use the web archives is it's some sort of documentation which is lacking enormously in the web archives. Uh, you can get a small, you can get some documentation on the, on the collection level, but that's more or less it. So, so that's uh, how bad it is <laughs> in, in, in a way. Uh, and the only metadata you can get is the metadata that is created by the crawling software or that is already in the HTML files, which is huge, a huge difference. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Can we ever understand how much of this we've already lost? And, and we should be able to do that, some of that computationally from broken links and things which don't link to other things mm. in, in the... And has there been any attempt to try and figure out how little of the web we have managed to archive at different points in its history? We actually have a s sort of a study of that in, in the book you mentioned in the beginning, uh, the one that was published recently. Um, and the, the web as history, and we did in, in a Danish in a study of the Danish web, uh, we tried to find out how much of the Danish web was archived in the Internet Archive. The Internet Archive archives a lot, but so what we did was we, we had access to the domain name, the national domain name list, which is 1.1 million domain names, and we gave that list to the Internet Archive and say. How much do you have? And it was between, I, I don't remember the figures, but 20, 30 percent. And it changed per year. Some of the years it was much more, and many of the years it was a lot less. So they have lost, lost a lot of the national web domain. But in terms of the national web archives, they, they, they uh, it's, it's difficult to say how much they get, but I, I, I guess they get a lot, close to all of it. But again, it takes time. So it, it takes between two and four or five months to archive an, an entire national domain. Uh, and of course, you lose a lot there. Yeah. Any other questions? Simon, do you want the mic? Come down and meet you halfway. <laughs> um, hi, we're working. Uh, Niels, thanks for a very interesting talk, and thank you for also being provocative with it as well. Thank you. This is always on the agenda. A uh, very simple question. Okay. Um, you showed us a pretty tool for web archiving with all those different um, things that you had to select and the parameters you set on there. Uh, you just mentioned that that's the one that you used. I just wanted to ask you, what are you archiving and for what purpose? You personally, not the National Danish... I started, uh, actually my background is, uh, I have a master's in uh, French culture and language and the history of ideas. From that I moved into media studies. And when I came to media studies uh, at my university in Aarhus, uh, none of my colleagues, it was in the late 90s, they were not studying the internet. 
studied radio and television and newspapers, so I said, okay, no one is going for this internet. I'll go and get that. So I started to be interested in the internet, and still, since I have a historical interest and background, I, I would like to study the history of the web. But I could see that it disappeared. So then I had a, a project together with what later became the National Danish Web Archive about how can you create a national web archive. But in that time period, I just started to go and grab what I could get myself. And it was more or less random. And my f the first thing that interested me was, was events. So I made a huge collection about um, the Olympics in Sydney in 2000. I guess it's still one of the biggest collections <laughs> that we, we have uh, about, about what the web looked like in relation to the Sydney Olympics. And I made a collection about, uh, for, about the city where I live. They had a portal, Aarhus.dk. I went through that, took out all the links, and started to archive that. I archi archived one third of it, and then I stopped. It was too much. And, and then, after a couple of years, the National Web Archive was established, and then I stopped. So I don't do any archiving myself. Thank you. I think we've made you work hard for your glass of wine, which is coming next. Um, so we'll stop there. We can continue chatting in the foyer after. We do have cake, we do have wine, we do have nibbles. So please stick around and join the conversation. I'd just like to thank Niels for coming over today and for talking a fascinating lecture about web archiving. Um, we do have a patented UCLDH goodie bag to say ah. thank you very much for your time and for coming. Thank you. Um, and that includes uh, the Bentham cookbook, all the recipes from Transcribe Bentham, which uh, we have uh -huh. published together as a cookbook. Um, so everyone, please put your hands together and thank Niels for coming over today. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.